Good evening, and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Katie from Greenlight, and we're thrilled to host tonight's event, An Evening with Voices of Lefferts, in honor of their seventh issue, Flatbush Eats. Contributors Laurie Buck, Brenda Edwards, Bernie Jones, Nadia Ketore, John Munnelly, Zenia Nagorni, Susan Palm, Nancy Troiber, and Shelley Worrell will be reading their work, and you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Deborah Mutnick and everyone at Voices of Lefferts for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. Although we're not able to host the events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Now, just a few housekeeping things to go over before we get started. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and there are a couple of different ways that you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and to interact with fellow attendees. So if you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by our presenters, please post that in the Q&A module, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program, so please make sure you're putting your questions there and not in the chat. And importantly, tonight's feature title, Voices of Lefferts Issue 7, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person from 10 a.m. to, to 8 p.m., actually, at both of our Fulton Street and Flatbush Ave stores. And you can order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the US. I've dropped the buy link in the chat and I'll be dropping it again in just a moment. As a thanks for attending tonight's virtual event, we're offering 10% off the featured book. Enter the coupon code GREENLIGHTEVENTS10 into the coupon discount section at the checkout for 10% off. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Your host for tonight will be Deborah Mutnick, director of the Voices of Lefferts Community History Project. She's lived in, lived in Prospect Lefferts Gardens since 1996 and teaches English at Long Island University's Brooklyn campus. She'll be presenting the new issue of Voices of Lefferts and introducing our readers for tonight. Please take it away, Deborah. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, and uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, welcome to the launch of issue number seven of Voices of Lefferts, the Flatbush PLG Community Writing Journal. In the late 1930s, the Federal Writers Project, a government-sponsored public humanities program under the aegis of the New Deal's Works Progress Administration, unparalleled since then in its scope and achievements, set out to tell the story of, quote, American cookery and the part it has played in the national life. Inspired in part by this never wholly pub published trove of food stories, recipes, and images, and in part by the ways in which the pandemic raised our consciousness in our neighborhood and all around the world about the necessity of food in a period of lockdown, fears of contagion, loss of health, life, jobs, and income, hunger, mutual aid, and community fridges, Voices of Lefferts embarked on a project called Flatbush Eats in the winter of 2021. What you'll hear tonight is the first of two special issues of the journal on that theme, because I wanna keep this introduction short to give as much time as possible to this evening's authors. I'll refrain from saying more, but invite questions during the Q&A about the FWP, Flatbush Eats, and the Voices of Lefferts Community History Project in general. And of course, about the uh, work that you'll hear in just a minute. Thanks to our graphic designer, Frank Marchese, photographers, Nancy Troiber and Neil Carpenter, whose terrific photographs you saw a few minutes ago, editors, Betsy Andrews, Jean Barron, Brenda Edwards, Robert Gibbons, Liz Oliver, and Andrea Phillips Merriman, and copy editors, Ron Dranger and Rena Kleege. Thanks also to Humanities New York and Long Island University for their generous support as well as PLG Arts, Park Slope Copy Center, and especially our host Greenlight Bookstore for all the support you give to us and to other groups in the community. I'm going to list tonight's authors in the order in which they'll appear, and then they will each briefly introduce themselves. The readings always spark questions and comments, so please write your questions in the Q&A, and we look forward uh, to the dialogue. Shelley Worrell, John Minnelli, Brenda Edwards, 
Nadia Kitore. I just tried to pronounce that the way you pronounce it, Nadia. I totally blew it. Um, Nancy Troiber, Lori Buck, Bernie Jones, Zenia Negorni, and Susan Palm. Let me now pass the virtual mic to our first reader, Shelley Worrell. Thank you, took me my, I actually went and I physically got a copy today. So I'll be reading um, from, my, from my hard copy. Um, so my name is Shelley Worrell. I am a lifelong Flatbush native. I still live in the neighborhood. Um, also the founder of Caribbean and Little Caribbean NYC. Saturdays. So for those of you who live in the neighborhood, I hope that you've gone and enjoyed roti from Ali's, Hot Pot, Jen's, and others. My family, my parents lived in an apartment at 2150, 2150 Bedford Avenue, just north of Church Avenue and one block from the African burial ground. My mother worked at Sears in their catalog and collection departments. After I was born, she worked weekends as a home health aide to make ends meet until she landed a job in the city on Maiden Lane as a junior accountant at an insurance company. She'd return from these jobs and prepare roti every weekend, every weekend for my father and his friends while they lined, a Trinidadian term meaning to hang out over food, conversation, and laughter. It was an experience she described as slaving. Maybe because my mother is Indo-Caribbean or because of her long wavy black hair and turmeric colored skin, or because of my father's views on gender, his assumption was that she could and would make roti like it was her duty. Perhaps it had to do with her being in his eyes, a country bookie, an unsophisticated person from the countryside, which is often what he called her. Or perhaps it was just an extension of his cultural heritage and a way to back home in Trinidad. It's hard to know exactly where my dad's beliefs about my mother and her roti making, roti -making duty came from. They could have easily history of the West Indies. After the emancipation of Afro-Caribbean slaves in the British West Indies in 1834, the need for labor brought large, brought large populations of indentured workers, mainly from India and China. They were called coolies, a South Asian word considered a racial slur that translates to low wage or indentured laborers that still gives me chills when I hear it. Indian laborers brought, brought their culinary traditions, which were blended with African flavors, resulting in a rich Creole culture and cuisine with standout dishes like callaloo, cups, and curries. The woven veins of slavery and indentured ship, forced migration and resourcefulness, and the resulting fusion of food and culture is my family and culinary history. One of the most iconic dishes of Indo-Caribbean cuisine is roti, a flatbread prepared with flour, oil, brown sugar, baking powder, and yeast, then filled with split piece, seasoned split piece or bus up, a more flaky buttery version. One by one, rotis are cooked on a hot tawa after carefully being rolled out on a floured surface. In Trinidad, parlors popularized roti, making it what I would call the national dish of the Indo-Caribbean population. But in truth, everyone loves it. Traditionally, roti was eaten on very special, occasion, special occasions like weddings and special holidays. But more recently, it's become an everyday dish. You'll find it served with a variety, variety of curries from chicken, duck, goat, rabbit, wild meat, or shrimp with a healthy portion served with potatoes, chana, bhaji, and okra. Back home, rotis are also served with mouthwarding East Indian delicacies like chutney, tamarind sauce, and kuchula. And with every roti, slight to pe plenty pepper sauce. That's how I love it, by the way. Roti is best eaten with your hands, using it to dip into the curries and chokas that are perfectly separated into heaps, preserving their distinct flavors from sweet to sour to spicy and allowing you to savor every, each until your belly is content. These flavors, this way of cooking and eating, made home, made Flatbush home in my father's mind. But recreating it where we come from isn't always what we imagine it will be. When my father, when my parents divorced, my mother gave her tawa to my godmother Judy as a rejection of labor of making hundreds, if not thousands, of rotis from slaving over them, as she recalls. The roti became a reflection of my family's past, path of what we would go on, what we would hold on to, and what we would let go of as we grew into this new life in the United States. When he began, when he became for the family, it became a ritual bridging his home 
his life back home and his family here in, in Flatbush. Everyone would gather the Boulevard, apartment 5G for roti and curry on Saturday afternoons and we would sit together and eat as a family. Thank you much. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, hello, my name is John Munnelly and I'm going to be reading from my essay titled The Great Hunger. It could very well have been titled What Fried Potatoes Mean to Me or even How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Hot Sauce. My piece traipses in a jolly serious way through Irish history, my own family upbringing, the Flatbush Caribbean influence and how it all eventually relates to my hot sauce creation, hatwood.com. In this reading, we drop in at the final section where I am co coincidentally, like this evening, back in Ireland for a short visit. Part six is called Homeward Bound. The food I often miss from my Irish culture is the bag of fish and chips. It was originally a British dish, but then somehow Italian families and artisans moved over to homely Catholic Ireland and became experts in the frying of spuds. I am always on the lookout for a fish and chip fix thick and steamy real spuds and a light battered flaky cod. I pass places and assess how their fry up might rate, sometimes traveling far off my usual trail to get a re-up of what I ache for, literally under the bridge, the Williamsburg Bridge. One of the things to watch out for in an Irish chipper is brown colored malt vinegar. It has a distinctive aroma and is offered simultaneously with a good smattering of salt. Being asked if you want salt and vinegar will sound thus, salt vinegar, all one quick, mellifluous word, accompanied with a questioning raise of the eyebrows, the vinegar bottle hovering over the heaped brown paper bag. I was back in Ireland in 2013, driving from city to town, promoting and playing my CD. So I was getting more than my fair share of the missing chips because I would starve before a gig from nerves and make up for it afterwards with a big feed, usually of something fried because that's all that was available late night. I was back in my hometown and initially booked for only a short support slot, but due to the headliner having some mishap, I got to play a full set in front of my family, friends and neighbours. Mam entered during my first set and immediately went to lie down across the empty wooden bench that was running diagonally away from the stage front. She wasn't really aware or cared what anyone thought. She had passed that point decades ago. I leaned over for my guitar tuning intermission and exhorted her to stay vertical. I saw that the bench had no back for support. <clears throat> Mammy, I think you'll have to sit up during the show. Is that okay? Maybe move around to the other side of the table and you can lean up on the wall there. I said this carefully, self-aware as I tried to balance my performer vanity in front of the crowd and the eruptive emotional fragility of my mother. Oh, John, I'm very tired, she said, slumping over on her arms onto the big wooden table instead. It was the first and last time she had seen me perform my full repertoire of original songs. I wondered if she had liked them. I wanted to know and get my mother's praise and approval like any small boy does. We had bonded a little bit in later years, as long as I kept off certain subjects, like her house, and was not likely to interfere in her life, off safe and sound in America. She did like me to send her CDs of my recordings, no matter how rough and basic they were. Between me and my mother lay the physical gulf of a plane trip, but also my mother and I were somewhat like identically charged magnets. The nearer we got, the further apart we were driven, repelled by the proximity to each other and her hoarded house. After the show had wound down late that same night, we went for one of the last meals I ever remember having with her, while we sat in out of the rain in my rented car. We drove down to Bridge Street and I got two portions of fish and chips in double layer, brown paper, nose bags battered golden cod, a big lump of it breaking off in glistening shards of moist, hot white flesh with paw, pawfuls of scalding thick real potato chips. The big splash of malt vinegar dumped in by the Italian behind the counter formed a cloud of aromatic steam in the car as we opened up the two bags. The salt felt rough on the surface of my fingertips, initially giving a melting sandpaper edge to the top layer of the dome of fries as I dug my hand into the scalding fried starch. I gingerly held the still broiling spud baton between my teeth with lips held away from the heated vinegar vapours and breathed in and out rapidly to cool the crispy golden potato finger until I could manoeuvre it inwards. I gently squeezed into the crispy flesh and smushed the moist and tender interior under my side teeth.
My mother and I generally butted up against each other. I said something to her in between the hot chiplets and she blurted out a cranky and hurt. Leave me alone, take me chips, can you? I did. I let whatever was niggling at me that night go. I was grateful to see her and doubly so in that she even went to the gig as well. She was a miracle, an agrophobic Lazarus risen from her bed and appearing to Manny and to me. There were times in the future that I would be home from abroad and she wouldn't even come out of the house. So a meeting like this one had to go a long way in satisfying the still gaping wound of how much mother I wanted and how much mother I ever received. Always hungry like a little bird in the nest waiting for mother hen I was. Thank you. I'll hand you on to the next reader. Thank you, John. I'm Brenda Edwards, a longtime resident of Flatbush and PLG. I'm going to be reading an excerpt from my essay, which is called Rice Rituals. My mother would often tell the story of my father, who grew up in extreme poverty on one of South Carolina's sea islands, which also extend to parts of North Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, where African Americans are known as Gullah or Geechee people. Because of their relative isolation from the mainland, they have maintained many features of their African heritage. The intona intonation and structure of their language, sometimes confused with Caribbean language patterns, the rhythm and style of the music, the science of the traditional medicines, food preparation, and the craft of weaving baskets from seagrass used to transport items and to make a special basket for sifting rice, all originating in their homeland. My father was an only child whose parents died when he was a baby, leaving him in the care of distant relatives whose lives revolved around the grueling work of sharecropping, emerged in the skill of cultivating crops, some of which they would never taste. The corn, peas, leafy vegetables, and livestock they labored over were all sold to offset the outrageously inflated payments they had to make for the use of the land. At other times, the family was consumed with protecting themselves from horrific acts of lynching, from painful reminders that they were only one and two generations removed from enslavement, noting that little had changed since the Emancipation Proclamation. My father felt that he was a burden to his relatives and that they looked upon him as an extra tribulation to be housed, clothed, and fed. The time was around 1910 when he was just five years old. My mother told me that he could distinctly remember the abject hunger that poverty brings and the meager morsels of food that were reminiscent of life on a slave plantation. Mom said he would always declare that cornbread scratched his throat when offered a slice of this Southern staple. He was not expecting the moist, tender, rich cornbread I knew. He was anticipating the coarse, harsh variety that loomed in his recollection of hard times. The minimal ingredients varied depending on what was on hand, cornmeal, water, or a little milk if you had it, oil, and baking powder. It is then fried in a heavy pan until done. This bread served as sustenance, but was also a reflection of his traumatic childhood. And while dining on a meaty, succulent chicken breast, he would affirm that as a child, he never knew that a chicken had any edible parts other than the feet. Although this may be an exaggeration on my father's part, for me, it expresses a sentiment widely shared by impoverished, disenfranchised Black folks who attempted to make peace with their food deprivation and lack of choices. But there would be one food source that my father never would never part with. In the Gullah Geechee tradition of his past, rice was a fundamental ritual, part of each evening meal. Red rice, slightly, slightly sweet, simmered and seasoned with tomato paste, garlic, onions, green peppers, and various spices. It paid homage to its predecessor, jollof rice, with its many virgins eaten throughout West Africa. There would also be rice cooked with shrimp, crab meat, or chicken, and hopping john, rice cooked with black eyed peas, all superbly prepared by my Floridian mom. Of all the rice dishes, my father's favorite was plain white rice, cooked to just the right firm consistency. His main purpose was soaking up the juices from the savory meats and vegetables 
of that night's menu. Rice rituals were such an established affair in our household that once when my mother decided to surprise my father with baked potatoes, he offered only a look of betrayal. The three of us were seated at the dinner table. The baked potato appeared. My father eyed the steaming, starchy white flesh as if it were an intruder that had viciously forced its way into our home. After a few minutes, the decision was made. The intruder was banished and we patiently waited for the rice. Years have passed since my father's death when I was 10 years old, leaving me with many haunting questions about his family, his Gullah Geechee childhood, and the life he led when at 16, he hopped on the freight train to the north. After landing in Baltimore, he made his way to Harlem, where he met my mom, who was nearly 20 years his junior. They both were residents of a rooming house where my mother supplemented her income from various housekeeping jobs by cooking and cleaning for the mostly male tenants. I'm gonna stop there and invite you all to, um, uh, you know, to please purchase our wonderful book um, by all of the authors that you see here, of course, including myself. And uh, once you uh, read my story, you'll find out how I take you on an adventure from the South to Africa. And um, I, I make a connection between my Southern roots and African roots all through a rice dish. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. My name is Nadia and uh, I am a resident of PLG. I am a mother of three school age kids and I am on a journey to bring uh, a change in food in schools. And I'm gonna read my story, uh, some parts of my story. And the title is Tunis to Brooklyn. I have lived 20 years in the United States, the longest I have ever lived in one country. At first, it felt strange to stay in the same place for so long. I am so used to changing countries, schools, scenery, and cultures. I feel like a traveler from Tunisia, here on a mission to learn new things, to take back home one day to help my people. Then my first child was born, and my second, and then my third, and home became Brooklyn, Prospect Lefferts Garden. I can still remember my father saying, come back to Tunisia, you are kind, you are generous, come put your roots in your country. My father traveled the world as a diplomat, taking his family with him. When he retired, he stopped traveling once and for all. He said he wants to enjoy his own country. But his words did not resonate with me. When life seemed hard and I missed my family, I regretted not listening to him, but it was too late. My life was here and slowly and discreetly, my roots started taking shape in this foreign land. I was pregnant with my first child when my husband and I moved to a second floor apartment on Lincoln Road. We were blessed with a second baby girl quickly after, and my busy time as a mother was spent breastfeeding under a tree at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, running after my kids at the zoo and buying coconut water on North Strand Avenue. I am a nurturer. As a kid, I played with my doll and made sure to provide water, food, and a warm bed. As an adult, I was ready to take care of my kids and spend my days with them. I didn't see it any other way. I breastfed my kids. It came very naturally. My mother did not breastfeed any of her four kids. Motherhood for me was all and still all about nurturing bellies and souls. When it was time for solid food, it never occurred to me to buy food made by someone else. Of course, I would make it myself, who else? I made them pureed vegetables, fruit, cups, and I cooked from scratch everything we ate. When I was growing up, we never ate outside the house unless we were traveling. And that explained the exception to the rule. I was three years old when we moved to Switzerland, close to the French border. After all these years, I still remember the food. These, there was an amazing bakery on every corner. Some mornings, my dad would stop at the bakery on our way to school and treat us to croissant and pain au chocolat. At lunch, we ate at the school cafeteria. We ate hot food in real plates made by the cooks in the kitchen. Our two hours of lunch were divided into equal time for eating and play. After school, my mother prepared a snack for us, often a cake and fruits. What felt normal at that time feels like a dream now. PLG feels like Tunisia in a way, beautiful, chaotic, and human. I enjoy my morning walks, especially in June after the rain cleans the streets and flowers and plants are wet and the scent of roses takes me back to my grandmother's garden. My friend Nicole started a French support, a French, a free support group, Meals for Moms, for women who have just given birth. Twice a week, a neighbor brought a whole meal for my family with desserts. 
I soon became part of that group and cooked for other, other moms. Tunis could learn from Brooklyn how to build community. My neighbor Nazmin, who lives on Fenimore, made, be, made me the best macaroni and cheese I have ever tasted. Now I meet her often at the Park Slope Food Co-op. I also feel very close to my Caribbean and African neighbors. I am African. I leave my house and in my hands, I carry my kofa, a traditional Tunisian basket. I visit Roger, the coconut guy on Flatbush Avenue. Fresh coconut water is by far one of my favorite drinks. I enjoy it in the morning with a teaspoon of rose water and a teaspoon of beet juice. My mother distills rose water every year in the spring. The associated supermarket on my street carries organic mangoes, avocados, dragon fruit, and jackfruit. At the checkout, I drop my load of natural goodness on the, mon on the moving tray and notice the contrast between the textures of my fruit and the artificial plastic wrapped processed food-like groceries. I go home with a kofa full of fresh vegetables and fruits, the only food I buy in my neighborhoods. Here in the United States, school days are so busy and frantic that kids don't have time to eat. They have 10 minutes from the time they sit down to eat, clean their table and leave for their next class. Mission impossible for anyone to enjoy food and much less digest it. Plastic candy bags came home, sugary whole grain cereals that I would have never bought for my kids' school lunch. And they started snacking like birds. I was furious and I could not trust the school that was teaching my kids to read and write with their health. I hear a lot that the USA is the best country in the world. I don't appreciate the competitive approach. How can we affirm that we are the best country in the world when the rate of children's obesity in the US is one of the highest in the world? Food is not a commodity. It is too precious to be left to trade driven by profit, says Vandana Shiva, an Indian environmental activist. That is how I feel when I see the poor quality food sold in my neighborhood. At the doctor's office, kids are offered lollipops. The teacher sends them bags of treats to celebrate the beginning of the year, Halloween, Christmas, Valentine's Day, birthday parties. Health is a result of everyday habits. The very little things that don't seem to matter at first, but will make you either strong with a clear mind or sick with a foggy brain. Life requires a strong body and a clear mind. I don't see how it will be possible for all these kids who eat too much sugar and too many additives to become the leaders we need them to be. It will not happen because they will be slowed down by disease and pain. It seems that our city has put corporations in charge of our, our kids' health because it is too expensive to buy fresh ingredients and allow the cooks to be in charge of the kitchen. New York can learn from Tunis, show more respect for food in schools and allow kids time to eat and rest. The whole world will benefit from a change in food culture in the US. Thank you so much. Usual thing, Nancy, you need to unmute. There you go. Try that. We'll be right back. There we go. Okay. Hi. Thank you, Nadia. Good evening, my name is Nancy Treuber. Neil Carpenter and I were the photographers for this issue. I was given the opportunity of a photo essay. I chose to wrote, write about the Maple Street Community Garden, which I helped start in 2013. I'd like to begin with an introduction to the garden titled Flatbush Eats and the Maple Street Community Garden. This will be followed by my artist statement entitled Pictures of Light. I'm starting my um, photo essay um, with a <clears throat> poem by Mary Oliver entitled Praying. It doesn't have to be the blue iris. It could be weeds in a vacant lot or a few small stones. Just pay attention, then patch a few words together. And don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't a contest, but the doorway into thanks and a silence in which another voice may speak. 
This special issue of Voices of Lefferts, Flatbush Eats, celebrates the writing of stories about food. The Maple Street Community Garden celebrates the growing of food as storytelling. The Maple Street Community Garden is located in Flatbush, surrounded by a chain link fence and a gate. The gate opens from Brooklyn Street to a garden of stories, histories, a place, but also a collection of memories. These stories connect us to a plot of land where the simple wearing, repetitive tasks of tending, digging, raking, planting, watering, weeding, harvesting, and composting blossom into a melange of recipes and histories and voices. The garden is fertile soil for these stories. Um, this is my artist statement entitled Pictures of Light. I'd like to start with a quote. In photography, there is a reality so subtle that it becomes more real than reality. Alfred Stieglitz. Some photographers take pictures of things. I take pictures of light on things. I am a self-taught photographer. My approach to each photo opportunity is to start with a clean slate and as few preconceived notions as possible. I follow the light to define the subject. In every shot, a person, a flower, a building, I try to capture the glow from within. My photography comes out of my study and appreciation of art history, looking at paintings, looking at art, at how light is interpreted by other artists through paint or sculpture, how the shape of a form affects the play of light on it. I enjoy looking at the architectural detail how the light falls on a stairway or the pediment over a doorway and fills in the lines, creating texture. I love finding a radiance of light on a building facade, then finding its source to be the sun reflecting off a window across the street or at home, seeing how sunlight creeps across a shining floor. The play of light informs the current body, the body of my current work. I photograph fruits and vegetables for the Fresh Food Box program weekly newsletter of the Maple Street Community Garden. I photograph in the garden every Saturday morning with the sun as my light source. In the garden, I photo photograph the fruits and vegetables beneath the large willow tree. When the wind blows, it moves the fronds of the tree, changing the light. I find that very beautiful. To get that light, I move around a lot. The light is moving, the willow fronds are moving, we are all in an intricate dance, catching the light on a potato and making it more than what it is. I want my photographs to open ways of seeing for others, of their finding the joy and wonder that I do in looking closely at small, simple objects and patterns, the ordinary details of life to make them unfamiliar and strange again, to see them anew, always inflected by light. Such acts of seeing require slowing down and closing in on the fine grained textures, hues, and signs of wear in order to grasp the big picture in all its infinite beauty, variety, and flux. I hope I can make people see the subtlety that Stieglitz saw to take the time to savor this fleeting interval and hold it. And I'm going to pass this on now to Lori Buck. Thank you, Nancy. That was beautiful. Um, hi, I'm Lori. Uh, I'm going to read the opening of my piece, which is really about cooking during the pandemic. Um, so I finally got to it and called my father. It had been about a month since we last talked. I felt guilty, but then he hadn't called me either. Before my mother died, I could count on one hand the number of times he'd called me in my life. Since her passing two years ago, I now need just my two hands, but no elbows or toes. He always answers when I call and I love how chatty he's become lately, but his aversion to dialing to the dialing of my number still sticks in my thoughts. This call he answered and immediately told me that he was getting ready to cook beef stew. It makes a lot of beef stew now that he cooks for himself, a dish 
I do not remember my mother ever cooking. My mother was a wonderful cook, an abundant cook. Her palate firmly rooted in the food of the old country, the country she fled as a child and that no longer exists in this world, a country she missed terribly and kept alive through her cooking. I grew up eating metlube, a layered dish of rice and meat, and delicious bread pies filled with spinach or lamb called fatayr bin sabanech or sviha. All the foods of the Levant from the old country, from her family table and her memories of Jerusalem. Now my father eats the food from his childhood. Beef stew, steak Diane, and something he loves called Indi Indian pudding. This phone call, he was also getting ready to make the pudding and he asked me if I'd ever had it. I said, I don't recall, but if I did, I'm sure it was called indigenous people's pudding. He didn't hang up then but I could hear the exhale, the nervous laugh, and the desire to get on with it. He said he needed suet for the recipe, but he couldn't find it, not even from the butcher in the market in town. I looked up substitutions for suet. Turns out Crisco, which he had in the cupboard, would work, would work better than butter. He said he remembered eating put Indian pudding when he was a student in Boston. Um, most of what he talks about now with me are his days before he knew my mother, just like most of what's landing on his plate. I asked him to call me and let me know how the pudding turned out. I've been happy to talk with my father about food during this year of endless cooking. He's trapped in his rural Midwestern home, and I'm trapped here in Brooklyn with my two boys, who eat at least three times a day, each meal or snack on a fresh, clean plate and made in pots and pans that, thank God, can all be loaded into the dishwasher. I inherited the loading of the dishwasher efficiently gene from my father, packing the plates neatly and never running it until every dish is snug and every spot is taken. It must take him days and days to fill his now that my mother is gone. He's lonely, I'm lonely, it's been a year of lonely and cooking. And he and I talk about cooking to fill up some of that space. But why are all his meals from circa 1955? What about the feasts my mother was famous for? These are the foods I'm cooking now and the food talks I want to have with him while I'm missing her and missing sitting across the table from him. Those foods are our family's foods, not beef stews or fish chowders. Why does he reach so deep into his past for comfort and not search for the table he shared with my mother, my brother, and me? And I'm going to end there. Um, more to follow and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave it to the next reader and, and thank you all. Thanks. Thank you, Laurie. I, I'm Bernie Jones and I'm reading an excerpt from Grocery Shopping and Cooking in Flatbush, My Mom and Me. My mom's ministry was food shopping. She called it Christian charity. Although she'd been a nurse, she had the heart of a social worker. After my mom's younger sister on Daisy moved away from New York City, my mom bought her Caribbean staples like green bananas because it was more expensive for her to buy them where she lived in Philadelphia. Whenever Aunt Daisy came to visit, she arrived with empty shopping bags that became full by the time she was ready for the drive back home. My mom's older sister Aunt Doreen received plenty of shipping barrels when she moved back to the Caribbean after her retirement. Those barrels contained the items my mom and Aunt Daisy bought for her. The two sisters coordinated in packing food items and whatever else Aunt Doreen needed. This was not limited to Aunt Doreen, however. Other relatives back home needed help, plus neighbors in New York City. My mom knew about the food pantries. She was happy to tell everyone what she learned from her network of Caribbean matrons about how to help those who are hungry because they suffered from food insecurity. My mom read her sales circulars the way other people read their Bibles. It was like a textual exegesis. She was in search of bargains to stock up on, and she rarely bought anything that was not on sale. The week she died in February of 2019, she gave me the last grocery list I have from her, full of careful instructions. She knew how much money I needed and often gave me more than was necessary. She urged me to buy whatever I needed for my own household. I included a picture of the list. She knew the differences in sales prices from one week to another, or even months later, 
and sometimes had the rain checks to prove it. We still get sales circulars, but nobody even glances at them. I, on the other hand, can barely remember the cost of anything I buy from one day to the next, even if it was earlier that day. I only patronized a few stores among the whole list of shops she knew. Mohawks on Clarkson and Bedford in the 1970s became wall bombs by the 1980s. It is ideal food basket today. Then there is Key Food on Flatbush and Lenox and the Green Grocer on Caton Avenue and Flatbush. When I cannot find baking supplies like parchment paper at any of those stores, the neighborhood dollar stores, there are plenty of them around, often have some available. The 1970s must have been a glory days time of my mom's life. Her mom and sisters, my grandmother and aunts, all lived nearby. They were together then for the first time since she and her sisters emigrated to the US in the 1960s. I remember all kinds of family gatherings and cooking. One memory that sticks with me was a year that Aunt Daisy and my mom decided to wrap up the coins they had saved in a jar and use them to buy a Christmas ham as a fun exercise in learning how much they could buy. My grandmother said to me once that if I grew up and did not know how to cook, people would say that my mom did not raise me properly. Talk about old school, that was Mama. When my mom died, one of her friends from her Canadian upbringing told me that Mama was well known as a baker in their rural community. Apparently the cakes she made for the harvest celebrations were well liked. I learned from watching what these women did and from listening to what they said. As a result, by the time I finished high school, I had a good knowledge of the basics of cooking and baking. And the rest of the essay is a study of talking about my mom, my upbringing with her in Brooklyn, learning about cooking, grocery shopping, but also what I made of it on my own in terms of my own journey, in terms of cooking and baking and in the pandemic as well. So thank you for listening. And I hope you'll enjoy reading my essay and I'll pass things on to Zelia now. Thank you, Bernie. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, good to be with you. My name is Janya, and I'll be reading an excerpt from my story, A Seed is Our Mother's Prayer. Part one. It takes Mother Earth a long time to decide what she's going to create, and specifically who are going to be her inhabitants. She sings and prays for millions of years, which feel like minutes to her. Finally, she decides to build a tiny house into which she breathes life. She calls it a seed. She asks her great, great messenger, the wind, to scatter her seeds across the waters, mountains, and flatlands, over snowy cliffs and smoldering volcanoes. The wind spreads the seed far and wide, and when Mother Earth seeds land, she blesses them in their new home and awaits. In every seed, she puts a heart and a tiny spark. The heart is to help the seed to live and breathe, to sense and express, so her roots can grow strong. The spark is to help the seed to push through and flourish even amidst difficult conditions. She gives her seeds the ability to speak and to understand one another, to dream, to tell stories while they wait for the right time to burst. Part two. I first met Earl standing near a raised wooden bed at the Maple Street Community Garden, an urban green space situated in central Brooklyn. I watched Earl's leathery hands spreading the dark earth underneath them and in his intentions and tenderness, felt a reverence like a prayer in movement. He wore a dark blue baseball cap with the word sheriff stitched in bold white letters. He appeared to be in his seventies, but his humor was of a man much younger. Earl has a spark in his eyes that never gets dull. He took a carpenter's pencil out of his shirt pocket and poked several dozen holes in the earth. He opened the other hand and in it was a small mound of beige seeds. He carefully dropped each seed into a hole. I stood, I stood nearby watching him for a moment that seemed to bend time. Everything felt quiet and perfect. He appeared to mumble something as he was working. Was he praying? Was he talking to the seeds, reminding them where they came from and blessing their new home? I asked him what he was planting. Peppers, he said, as he straightened up his shoulders and looked into my eyes. He had brought the seeds all the way from Trinidad. I sensed pride in his voice, but there was something more. So I asked him about the seeds. The pepper is a short season crop, Earl tells me. It's not the type of crop that grows throughout the winter, but when the weather begins to warm up, put some seeds down and cover with an inch of earth. When they catch, many sprouts will come up. 
You must take them out, separate them, and replant them one foot apart. They do well here in the growing season. And when you pick your peppers, save the seeds for the next season. You can get up to 100 seeds from a single pepper plant. When Earl talks about growing, he's in his element, confident, playful, and charming. His eyes widen and his hands move in expanding spirals. Earl arrived in Brooklyn in 1989 with a pocket full of seeds. They held his roots, planted long ago into the soil of the land of his mother and his mother's mother. Generations of families surviving by tending to the soil and decorating their lives with the abundance of its offering. They braided their stories and songs into the seeds and the seeds were imbued with even more heart and fire. These seeds offered Earl joy and celebration and produced the food that brought his family together to eat and honor what they had. Gardening is more than growing for Earl. There's an element of communion too, sharing land and plant knowledge, sharing stories and sharing histories, breaking down walls and building new possibilities together. You see, he tells me, a seed grows into shoots and then branches. Even one branch is different from another. Some branches grow food and some grow seeds. Some grow both. Some grow the fruit in the root, like cassava. Some grow leaves. You cut the baji leaves and cook kalalu. You take the stems and put it in the ground and grow it again. Earl anchors me to this place in a way that only an elder could, with gestures, laughter, and stories, nudging me to look closer and always, always to pause. Part four. This is why we carry our seats with us. It's a survival instinct that Mother Earth has implanted in us, how nature works through us, to carry life, to carry our heart and spark wherever we go, to one day return home or create a new home, to tell and share our story so we can hold the memory of those who came before us, for our ancestors to finally find peace in our journey. Seeds invite us to claim who we are, Mother Earth's children, and the promise of new beginnings. Thank you. And I, the next reader will be Susan. Hi, I'm Susan Pong, and I've lived in Brooklyn for about 30 years. And where I grew up, there were lots of trees, and the air was incredibly fresh. And I'm reading from an article, my, Remembering My Grandmother, an Apple Pie. My grandmother had three apple trees. One was crab apple, transformed by pickling those tangy cinnamon crab apples, small, round, with long stems, glowed in transparent jars, adding another dimension of color to the shelves in her large basement pantry. The other two apple trees, her favorites, were Macintosh, her beloved Max. These provided multiple jars of sweet, honey-colored applesauce clear amber apple jelly, spicy, and a dark mahogany apple butter, while large slices of creamy white apples embedded in cinnamon became a mosaic pressed against the glass. The most memorable days with my grandmother were the cooler days of late summer, when we experienced the everydayness of working with apples, knocking apples off of trees, hauling apples into the kitchen, then the peeling, the coring, and the slicing of apples the poof of white flour, the rolling out of the dough, flipping the round crusts into prepared pie pans, pouring the mix of apples, beaten eggs, spice, and sugar into the raw crusts, blanketing them with another round of crust, pinching around the edges to keep juices from seeping out. Soon the aroma of spice and apple fills the kitchen and winds its way around the hallways, up the stairs, through the bedrooms, and out the very top windows of the house, down along past the kitchen door and across the garden where the fall cucumbers wait. The world pandemic, retirement, and lockdown have left me sitting at my kitchen table with a cup of coffee and memories of my grandmother's apple pies, their tangy spiciness, and the cool outdoors as her kitchen door slammed behind me and I looked up at those apple trees. My grandparents' home was on a hill overlooking Shawambagan Bay off Lake Superior in Wisconsin. Only three houses were on that hill, lots of room. Fields and pine trees sloped down to the shore. Across the water, too far to be seen, was Canada. 
I loved my summers there where it never got too hot and the air was clear and pine scented. My grandmother did a lot of cooking during her life. Only a small amount of her time was uh, devoted to apple pie. In the whirl of breads, biscuits, cakes, and muffins, chickens, pheasants, hams, and roasts, the canning seasons of fruits and vegetables from her garden, plus the wild blueberries in blueberry season, and the fish my grandfather caught. He wasn't going deer hunting anymore. She didn't have time to think beyond one classic apple pie that she had perfected. But here I am ruminating about the fullness of possibilities with apple pie and the history of companion flavors that had been merged with apples as they traveled from the old world to the shores of the new world and eventually to my grandmother's backyard. Thank you. So Next. <laughs> We are, we are finished and we actually have time for Q&A. Um, just, uh, I, we can't hear the applause of the audience, but we can see everything in the chat. And um, this reading was very much appreciated by uh, all of you who have attended. So thank you for that. Um, I see a couple of questions in the chat. Um, uh, Norma Williams asks, has anyone ever taken seeds from your homeland if your home is not America? Um, so I'm gonna let that be answered in the chat. So if you, if you do know uh, of someone uh, or if you yourself have taken seeds from your homeland, uh, if your home is not America, put, put that in the chat. Um, I, the, the other question that I wanna ask um, is, uh, about food um, as a generative theme. Uh, I am so impressed by everything that I've heard tonight. Um, and I've been watching these essays evolve. And I wonder if the writers could talk a little bit about how food inspired you, how the, the concept of food, the tangibility of food, food in gardens, food in markets, food in your kitchens inspired you. So. Anybody wants to take a stab at that? I'm inspired by ingredients. I start off with what I have available and I take it from there. Um, I'm inspired by sometimes videos I see. Um, I was, funny enough, this whole project inspired me to go through all my old um, cookbooks and um, files of recipes. And so I've been cataloging them. And I have like one of those Staples 21 section folders. I have two of them. That's how many of them I need just for all the pieces of paper. And I had, I'm not sure if you remember of this, any of you, back in the 90s, you could get in the supermarket these uh, magazine size cookbooks that were published by like Better Homes and Gardens and so forth. And I have this collection of them and I've just been going through them. So this afternoon I was cooking, you know, Mexican sopas. I never heard had them before, but I have this recipe for it. And flatbed flatbread from the Middle East and chili and sort of like I'm just inspired by whatever I have on hand sort of with the items that I have bought and just take it from there I always have flour I always have whole grains I always have some kind of protein source I always have vegetables so I sauteed spinach and tomatoes cherry tomatoes so I start off with what I have and then just take it from there and that is what excites me the creativity that comes with it thanks Thank you, Bernie. And also how it inspired you all as writers, um, how the, the theme of food enabled you to write these beautiful essays. Nadia? Thank you, Deborah. It was such a powerful experience to, to write about food because I breathe food and I talk about food all day long. For me, food is, is taking the time to live. When you look at a, at a produce, at a tomato, you take the time to look at it. So where I come from, we take the time to live. Everything is slow. And I always felt that it was a country that from another planet, because whenever we would leave Tunisia, I would feel that it was different. Tunisia had something that was different. And that's what it is. We take the time to pour a tea. If you've had a Moroccan tea, you know that it takes at least a minute to have the tea fall in the cup. It takes that time. So for me, food represents, you know, taking the time to be with our neighbors, to, to live life, to enjoy the moment, our kids, and not run. So processed food is opposite to everything that we should go for. It should never exist. And it's, it's, it's calling for a change in our society. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, food um, has such a history for most of us, as we heard, you know, whether it's our parents, um, where we come from. Um, the inspiration, of course, was my father's um, culture being uh, from South Carolina and how that reflects so much of African culture. So in my story, you know, I, I start to continue talking about um, the rice seeds. And I learned a lot because I had to do some research about uh, the rice culture and what it meant to um, what it meant to um, um, the slavery, how that became such a big profitable, um, um, you know, source of income and the labor and hardship that uh, it, it brought to, you know, Africans, to black people. And uh, so, and there's such a connection, you know, with the food. I'm, I've been, you know, as everybody talks about the food, there's such a connection. I can sort of identify with just about everything all of the writers, you know, said about food. Great. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, uh, we do want to try to end close to 8.30 and we're almost there, but Daniel Casey, and now there's, now there's several, several questions coming on all of a sudden, but let me get Daniel's first. Um, to all of you, the writers, how did the challenges of the last 18 months affect the way you approach the processes of developing and writing your amazing stories? Maybe somebody who hasn't spoken. John, Shelley. I'll go. Lori, there you go. Hi. Uh, the experience of the last 18 months, I think, um, forced us all to cook a lot more. I mean, it, it was just so isolating and so overwhelming to, um, to be home alone in our homes with whoever we were quarantining with and and to really explore what it meant and, and to slow down and to, uh, to cook every meal because we didn't have the luxury of going out or ordering in. And that allowed us to explore where we felt the comfort from food, where we felt the express from food, you know what I mean? Like, um, like quick, slow, uh, all the elements of, of what it meant to have to cook every single meal without the convenience of, of what we enjoy in our neighborhood and in our city of running out to get delicious roti, running out to get a quick sandwich or a quick bite from our favorite burrito place. We, we, we couldn't do that for so long. And, and I, I think that was sad and meaningful and and, um, and, and drove me to, to think more deeply about what it was I wanted to cook and why it was I wanted to cook that stuff. Thank you, Lori. Um, John, and then I think we'll, we'll wrap it up because it is- Do you want me to answer that question? Or are you okay with that? You had uh, mentioned uh, the process um, of yeah. developing a writing. Yeah, go well, ahead. So I was watching uh, Paul McCartney develop um, uh, one of his songs from Nearly Nothing, and then it changed into a protest song, uh, Get Back. And uh, for me, when I first produced my piece, it was a big slab of um, stuff about the great hunger, which is the great hunger was the famine. And so when my piece turned away from that and turned more personal, so that's how um, my process changed. When I worked with Andrea and batted it back and forth, and then eventually got to to Ron as the copy editor. But certainly with Andrea, it, it I chopped away a lot of that stuff. And like, not saying I'm like Paul McCartney, but I, Paul McCartney's song changed from being a protest about the political situation, about um, the windward generation and Pakistanis being told to get back to their own homeland and turned into a much different sort of song, uh, a masterpiece. But um, so that's how my, 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 my piece turned away from being a big slab of uh, 
ethno history about the Irish not having enough food to to be more sort of a you know a bigger picture um, memoirish type of thing. Thank you, John. Um, there are more questions in the chat. I'm sorry, or in the Q and A. I'm sorry not to be able to get to them, but I do want to respect everybody's time. Um, it's uh, been clear to people who've been on these kinds of virtual forums that 8.30 and one hour seems to be the witching hour and time to end. So um, I wanna thank Katie for hosting us and um, thank all of the authors for their amazing work um, and the photographers for their work. Uh, the books are now at Greenlight Bookstore. I hope you'll all go and pick them up. Um, and thank you, all of you who are attending, um, for joining us tonight and helping us launch issue number seven of Voices of Leopards. I want to thank Deborah and all of our readers tonight for this fantastic reading. It was such a wonderful time. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Don't forget to buy your copy of Voices of Leopards Volume 7, Flatbush Eats, in store or online at greenlightbookstore.com. The link is in the chat. And make sure that you use your discount code, which apparently wasn't working earlier, but it now should be working. Um, and that's in the chat as well. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>